Um, so the next two sessions, I'm going to have the next two hours with you. Um, the first one, I'm going to spend talking about myopic photo disguises. Um, it's something that we still know very little about, um, but we're going to go through as much as we can about what we already know. Okay. Okay. So as we as we all know, it's it's a complication of high myopia. Um, high myopia now being defined as um, more than minus six diopters or an axial length of more than 26 uh, and a half millimeters. Um, is it important, multi focus sizes? It is important uh, because the, the rate of high myopia is, is actually rising quite dramatically, not just in Asia, right, but also in Western countries as well. And we don't really know why. So, for example, in Asia now, the, the proportion of high myopes um, in certain populations have been uh, quoted to be as, as high as 38%. And in the United States as well, it's been reported that the myopia rate uh, has doubled um, just over the last 30 years, and that the prevalence of myopia over um, minus eight diopters has risen by at least eight times. Okay, so that's a, a huge number that we're going to be um, dealing with in the very near future. Now, what do we know about myopic photoscopies? We know that's one of the most common maculopathy that we see in high myopia, and apparently uh, um, occurs in about 34 percent of high myopic eyes. Right, and this term was actually introduced um, in 1999 to describe the splitting of the retinal layers at the macula, right, in association with the posterior staphyloma. Okay, now this really astounded me because uh, in 1999, um, all you had to uh, rely on was really your slit lamp biomicroscopy. There was no OCT at that point. Um, so, if you actually look at a, an eye with myopic photodiscrepancies that's actually been already proven on OCT, you find that it's very hard to see that there's actually any evident um, abnormality inside. Okay, some would say that they, you know, could imagine some microcystic appearance of the macula and things like, but it's really hard to hard to tell. Okay, now the only way that um, you you should tell yourself to raise your depth of suspicion is really that um, there is a posterior staphyloma. Okay, like in this case, you can see in this eye over here the the, the, the macula looks very much like what we'd expect in you know, a very highly myopic eye, but if you were to do an OCT, that's what you would get. Okay? And the vision can be 6.6 six or 6.7.5, 6, absolutely normal. Now, what are the risk factors um, in myopic uh, photoscopies? So we already mentioned that, yes, patients would um, uh, have a, a staphyloma, right? Um, they're also more likely to have very long axial lengths, so axial length of more than 31 millimeters, they would also have um, extensive corneal retinal atrophy. Um, and if you look at the vitreal retinal interface, you'll very often see uh, premacular elements and premacular structures and traction as well. Right. The older a patient is, older a patient is that's very highly myopic uh, with the chiaxial length um, and the staphyloma, right, then the more likely it is that he or she could have uh, bulimous crisis as well. Yeah. So this is the anatomy of um, <coughs> myopic focus crisis. This is a classic definition of what uh, focus crisis is. Okay, it's basically the, the, the splitting of the plane within the retina itself at the macula, right? Usually and classically described as um, between the helix layer and the photoreceptor layer. Okay? So that's where the blue arrows are pointing. Yeah? So that's classic myopic uh, focus crisis. Okay? And in, in these changes, you'll also see that the um, neural retina actually splits up into two different layers, a, a thicker outer, uh, a thinner outer retinal um, layer, and a, a much thicker inner retinal layer. And in between, bridging these two layers, we get all these what we call neural columns that uh, connect these two layers together, okay? Um, as we have mentioned earlier before, um, traction is one of the um, reasons why you're getting this problem. So when you do an OCT, also look out for um, what we call a localized posterior retinal detachment um, <coughs> as, uh, as well. Okay, so what is the pathogenesis um, at the moment, unfortunately, is still unclear, right? In the beginning, when we uh, first started looking at this condition, right, people were wondering whether or not all these ischemic cavities are actually macular edema due to traction, right? But um, as time went along, I think this is more and more uh, dispelled as, uh, as, as an urban myth. And at the moment, what we are more um, focusing on is actually a, a four hypotheses. Okay, firstly, the mechanical displacement of the sclera due to sclerectasia, so expansion of the sclera, uncontrolled sclera expansion, with the formation of a staphyloma in the posterior segment, coupled with the inability of the retina okay, to stretch and to drape nicely the contour of the, um, of, of, the con uh, of the posterior segment over here, like it is actually doing here. Okay? So not every case is able to achieve the kind of um, draping of the contour 
that is here. Now, the second um, hypothesis is that um, it could be due to the rigidity of the, inter, uh, the internal limiting membrane. Okay? And the reason why people suspected that was when we peeled off the internal limiting membrane and we sent it for cytology. They saw that there were actually collagen fibers and cell debris on the inner surface of these membranes. Okay, that could suggest that perhaps fibroblast um, proliferation could have a role in causing all this traction, uh, contraction of the membranes. Okay, and the third um, pathogenesis possibility is vitreal membrane traction. So uh, anomalous or um, perifovial or parafovial posterior vitreal detachment um, can be in the form of epiretinal membranes or sometimes posterior um, cortical uh, vitreous as well. Now, if you look at this um, OCT over here, what um, I want to show you is not just the skysis and um, all the membranes that are, that, that are um, in traction over here, but I'm not sure if you can see from the back, right? Um, when we, when we actually look at this OCT on the OCT screen, what we would actually see is also a layer of what we call cortical vitreous that's lining the entire surface of the posterior septum as well. Okay, and that is a very good illustration of what vitreal macular traction can be as well. And if you did, if you did the retracting in this eye and you stained it with dyes or you used tribesinolone, um, you would actually see um, all these cortical vitreous, um, you know, highlighted as an entire layer over the entire posterior um, segment, okay? Now, what about the fourth pathogenesis possibility? And it is that um, perhaps the, uh, the, the retinal vessels undergo sclerosis with age, okay? And they become stiff, and they can cause tenting of the retina. So instead of bending and, <coughs> and uh, following the contour of the cephalon as the cephalon be begins to develop, right? Um, it actually sticks out and causes traction. Okay, so this um, OCT has been published um, by Yasuo Tano's group, and it shows here that um, these areas with the arrows here are areas of what we call retinal micro uh, folds on the OCT, where the blood vessels are actually standing out proud and causing traction. And they've also reported that at these micro folds, there are usually a lot of vitreous as well, causing traction in these particular areas. Now this is another um, example of what we normally would see in our OCTs as well. So you can, this is a high myo again. At the edge of the posterior staphyloma in this area where the, the segment is crossing, you'll see that um, there is a blood vessel just here. And you can see a little knee, like a little um, knob in that area, which is what we call microfold. And this indicates that there's actually significant inward traction in the presence of axial length elongation in this very high myo. Okay, and you can see also that the um, internal limiting membrane is being lifted up as well. Okay, <laughs> what about OCT? So if you have a patient that you suspect um, of having a, a, a myopic ophiostasis, then um, obviously the next step to confirm the diagnosis would really be doing an OCT. Okay, now OCT, I would prefer to do a spectral domain OCT, or if you have the swept source OCT, right? Certainly, I would you know order a swept source OCT as well because the swept source uh, basically gives you a very large area um, of cut and it allows you to see the entire extent of the contour of the posterior segment. Okay, so order what we call a macular cube um, OCT so that you can see the entire range of cuts all the way from the top to the bottom so that you can get, get um, uh, a, a feel of the lay of the land, so to speak, okay? And in, in areas that you feel are a little bit more suspicious, you can do a fine line buster, okay, or a high definition buster. So you can see in this area over here, again, um, the sciences that's um, typically formed in the outer platform layer. Okay, so with a thicker uh, inner leaf and an outer, thin outer leaf. Okay, what about um, a more, more advanced classification of um, sciences? So in addition to what we have seen earlier, the traditional uh, classification of how sciences is, okay, we have also found that actually sciences can occur in different ways. Okay. So we have what we call the outer retinal skysis, which in this, um, in this case is over here. Yeah. We also have what we call inner retinal skysis as well, which happens nearer to the internal limiting membrane over here. Okay. So this area over here, this line over here, is not an epiretinal membrane. Okay. This line over here is actually the splitting um, of the internal limiting membrane. So that is, in itself is the internal limiting membrane. Of the retina. Now, when you have skysis that um, uh, involves both the inner and the outer retina, right, then it's called compound skysis, right? So when you're reading an OCT, it's good to describe it in that manner. 
And again, you can see over here how the microphones in this area over here um, causes tenting of the retina at the edge of the posterior um, staphyloma and how the internal limiting membranes are treated with the dog. Okay. Now, again, when you're looking at the OCT, it's also very good to um, describe where the major involvement is. So if you have um, areas of involvement within, um, uh, outside of the fovea, then just call it a non-fovea non involvement. However, if the fovea is involved, Right, then please um, make a note of the fovea involvement because um, this will sometimes dictate whether or not you want to follow the patient up um, at a, a more regular um, interval or even to recommend surgical intervention. Now, also look out for associated complications as well. Okay, so things like fovea detachment, uh, holes, hyperfibromella or full thickness holes, um, defects in the photoreceptor ISOS junction, the paradoxical holes, and RPCM. So I'm just going to show the examples of each of these points, okay? So this is an example of a, a, a skysis, okay, with a lamella hole, and we've seen this earlier before, a lamella hole being that the outer retina, the, the photoreceptors are, are still actually detached and still intact, okay? So this is what we call a lamella hole. Now, uh, once the um, fovea is detached, please make a, 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 a note of that because it is an indication for, um, for surgical intervention. So in this case, you can see here a foveal detachment, still quite localized, but in addition to that, there's also a defect in the uh, inner leaf of the um, retina, which uh, is a lamella hole, okay? And this patient obviously is at high risk of forming a full thickness macular hole or, or, or retinal detachment because of the extension of, a possible extension of this hole into a full thickness one. Okay, what about a photoreceptor ISOS defect, okay? So, what is the clinical relevance of this? Is it just an OCT finding that's got no clinical um, relevance? No, it is not. If you see in this case, this patient has got foveal detachment in addition to the um, skysis. And th this is um, confirmed also by looking at the choroidal hyper uh, reflectivity in this area as well, okay? Uh, indicating that there's more transmission of the um, reflectivity over the area that's deficient of the OSI junction. Right, so what is the clinical evidence, uh, uh, relevance? Basically that the, any defect, okay, in this uh, layer um, can actually result in intraretinal fluid in the sclitic um, uh, cavity migrating either into the subretinal space to cause retinal attachment or pushed out through the very thin um, area over here to form a full thickness macular hole, okay? And of course, if you have um, any intention of doing vitrectomy in this case, then you will want to take a note of, of this OSIS defect because it could affect the visual function after intervention. Okay, so this is um, an, an, an image from a publication from Yasuo Tano's group again, um, showing how a um, ISOS defect can be persistent even after vitrectomy. So it's not something that you expect to regenerate after treatment, right? And this obviously would um, ha have um, great ramifications on the outcome of um, surgery in terms of function, okay? Now, what about paravascular hole? This, this is not something that um, is often mentioned, but it's something that, practically speaking, we see quite often because of the how thin the retina is in the posterior hole um, of these eyes, okay? So what you would find is uh, very often you have coexisting eccentric <coughs> macular holes, not in the center of the um, macula or anywhere close by, but actually along the blood vessels uh, within the macular region, and these are called para paravascular holes. And these are usually the reasons why, um, after the macular, is, uh, macular hole is closed, why some uh, cases um, uh, end up with still a persistent macular detachment. Okay, so needless to say, all these paravascular um, macular holes need to be detected before surgery and then sealed during the surgery, and any uh, tractional forces will need to be removed from around it. Okay. And last but not least, um, a combination, a dual pathology. So if you have patients with myopic macular um, uh, photoscysis as well as myopic CMD in this eye. Okay, so you can see this patient actually presented completely asymptomatic before. He presented with um, a, a little bit of scotoma in the eye. And uh, all you could see was actually a small area of submacular hemorrhage, which you can see on uh, FFA. Um, has got this very lacklast uh, um, hyperfluorescence um, indication of leakage, what we normally would see in a mild CMD. Not a very, very foreign leakage, but a very minor one, right? So this is very typical of a mild CMD. And in the presence of a um, mild peak then it becomes very difficult to treat and monitor because of the um, 
inherent thickening of the macula, so it's very hard to see whether or not your, your anti-venture therapy is actually working. Yeah. Okay, so what is the natural history of mild corpus crisis? Unfortunately, okay, um, it is very variable. Yeah. So there are many cases that um, actually do remain very stable without significant deterioration in vision, vision, or even if they do deteriorate, it, it will do so very, very slowly. Right? And there are also cases where um, it's been reported to resolve so spontaneously, and we'll look at the case later. Right? Um, not common at all. Right? So in general, we'd say that you know, about 70 to 80% can sometimes remain very stable, and it can remain stable for years, a year, 16 months, um, two years, sometimes even up to four to five years. Right? Um, and a small percentage, two to three percent, will actually go on to develop a full fitness mask in the home. Spontaneous recovery, uh, spontaneous resolution of um, uh, skysis um, happens in about two to three percent as well. So not many at all. The um, degree of visual uh, impairment is also very variable as well. Okay, most people um, are completely asymptomatic. Okay, and if they are symptomatic, normally the vision is within you know one to two lines of what we would call normal vision, the six six. Yeah? And um, again, you know, even in a case like this, for example, yeah, with significant changes on the OCT, uh, visual acuity can be 6.7.5, and in this case, this patient's um, vision was 6.7.5, with very little change on OCT for almost three years. Now, the, uh, oh, the problem uh, with myopic ocular risk is um, if you have premacular structures, so traction at the premacular um, area, which usually is an uh, indication of very poor prognosis. Right? So a lot of these cases actually go on to um, develop into foveal uh, detachment or macular hole definite detachment. And it can happen in anywhere between 30 to 72% um, of these myopic eyes, depending on how myopic they are to begin with. Right? So you can see in this case only a significant um, uh, traction into the vitreous cavity by causing this crisis, and already a, a macular, uh, the manifold is open now. Okay, so what are the treatment options? Right. Observation is obviously, obviously one um, uh, very viable option. Now, if we are going to be doing active management, then we are usually looking in terms of detracting, right? We need to discuss uh, various um, adjuvant um, uh, treatments within the detracting realm, right? Macular buffing, we'll also speak a little bit about that. Um, so observation for uh, myopic foveal skysis, right? Um, like we said before, a lot of patients can be very stable for a very long time, right? So non-intervention can actually buy a patient many, many years of stable vision. So, so don't be in, in a hurry to, to intervene, right? And how do you know if um, a, a patient is going to do well with observation or whether or not they're going to be doing badly with observation? Now, there are some risk factors to look out for, okay? Things like premacular structures, for example, and every retinal that we saw before, right? If you have a partially detached vitreous um, uh, cortex, for example, there are some areas that are still attached, then these are the patients that you don't want to say, look, come back in about eight or nine months' time. You want to see it moving in about three or four months' time. Okay? If a patient already has foveal detachment, okay, and if you choose to watch these patients, then do see them at, at, at shorter intervals. Do not get them to come back six or eight months later, because these are the ones that will you know, go on to uh, uh, have very poor outcomes if intervened at a later stage. So this is a very interesting uh, patient that um, I saw, and in fact, um, I've followed up for about almost 10 years now. So she's actually 53, all right, and she was a minus 14 in my book. She refused surgery because she's got a host of other medical problems and she was asymptomatic. Yeah? So at diagnosis, she already had a foveal detachment, as you can see, in 20, uh, year 2007. Vision was 67.5, okay? Uh, review surgery, seen again um, at, at close intervals, and at 209, vision was 69, so it dropped. And you can see that there's an extension of the foveal detachment in this case, okay? Still review surgery, so we had no choice but to continue watching her. A year later, it's, it looked to us like the, the, the foveal detachment is, is, is improving, all right? And then in 2013, all right, you can look at the OCT over here, she seemed to have developed this what we call a dome-shaped macula, um, and spontaneously resolving um, where the skies is concerned, and vision has not budged from 6.9. Okay, so these are cases that um, I would say, you know, if the patient is not too keen for intervention, or if you're not sure of intervention, then do push the patient, because you have time, you have time to, to, to wait. What about indications for surgery? Okay, when would you say, look, you know, I, I would recommend that you have surgery done, right? If the patient is symptomatic, 
okay, there's symptomatic medical hypoxia, for example. If you have poor prognostic indicators, okay, at least with what, uh, the macular attraction that we talked about earlier, okay, significant ERM, significant EMT, for example, if the patient's already got a foveal detachment, that's something that I would consider very, very seriously. Um, if there's a, a macular hole already, I think there's very, very few options left for us. Right? If you have what we call an S4 stasis, where you can look at the classification of macular stasis um, in terms of area. So an S4 stasis would be one that's involved entire entire macular region. Okay, so these ones, you know, you probably want to push for intervention earlier rather than later. If you have an, a patient with ISOS junction um, disruption, for example, we saw earlier, these are the ones you want to intervene early as well. And if the central angle thickness is more than 300 microns, this <coughs> also would be something that I would consider intervening. All right. Okay. Now, when you do um, uh, recommend intervention, all right, at the moment, um, the standard recommendation for, for uh, surgical intervention uh, would be vitrectomy. Right. Now, the problem is the the result of vitrectomy is at the moment still very variable, and there are still a lot of things that we don't understand about vitrectomy in myopic photostasis. Okay, so we have, um, for example, we have patients who um, have been reported to do very well with vitrectomy alone, but in general, we know that uh, vitrectomy alone does not do as well with either ion peeling or with gas. Okay. Um, and on the other hand, there are also um, uh, issues with um, uncertainty over the role of ion peel, okay, and gas as well, right? So there are studies that said, um, you know, uh, vitrectomy with gas but without ion peeling can give you um, a success rate as high as almost 80%, right? And there are some that say, no, uh, you know, if you did a vitrectomy without gas, you can also get uh, up to about 80% of success rate, yeah? So things are still very fluid, things are still changing. Right? And you know, the, also, the problem also is that a lot of focus classes actually resolve on their own. Okay, it can be two months, it can be two years. So it's very hard sometimes after doing the vitrectomy to ascertain whether or not it was a vitrectomy that did the job or whether or not it was a spontaneous resolution as well. Okay. So the data is not clear on this. Now, what is the role of gas in, uh, in a case like this? Okay, do we always need to put in gas? The, the honest answer is we don't know. Okay. So it is thought to be able to hasten the resolution of stasis, right? And the gas is um, able to perhaps um, provide mechanical compression between the two layers so that the layers come together. Um, it also perhaps um, spreads out the subretinal fluid over a larger area so that the healthy RTE can actually pump out the fluid that's left there, okay? Um, and then there's another um, uh, uh, hypothesis uh, that you know, if you put in gas, uh, technically you achieve a rather dry retinal surface, and this might accelerate the absorption of fluid through the vitreous cavity. Okay. Now the problem with gas is really that um, the, the, the the risk of macular hole is reported to be as high as twenty five percent. So in a patient with no macular hole, um, turning up with a macular artery is going to be quite difficult to to explain sometimes. Okay. And this is thought to be a possible. Again, we don't know, due to the displacement of subretinal fluid okay, towards a very thin foveal um, roof and it breaking through, of course, no matter what. Okay, the other problem with um, IR peeling okay, is um, that it is in sort of eye, not a straightforward um, uh, procedure. It's technically very challenging right, because the eye is very long. You have also very thin retinal tissue, especially at the macula, it's very, very friable. And on top of that, it's very hard to visualize the different layers of the retina, okay, the ILM, or even the, the membranes um, growing on it, because there's very poor contrast. Everything is, is atrophic underneath, so there's no contrast for you to, to actually discern where your membrane planes are. Okay? So in these cases, yes, trimesome would really help. Membrane dyes or membrane blue tool would really help. Um, in ion peeling, that's where the, um, a, a lot of uh, changes are happening right now. Um, the question is whether or not um, uh, an, a complete ion peel or standard ion peel does as well as um, modified ion peel. Okay? The risk, like we mentioned before, of complete ion peeling is really that you may end up with a full thickness macula hole. And it's going to be uh, very difficult to, to, for you to, to explain, right? So, like I said, the risk is sometimes 25%, okay, in some cases even 30%. And um, what people have done now is actually evolve a different way of peeling, what we call a fovea sparing iron peel, okay, in order to reduce the risk of um, 
macular formation, and also reduce the risk of what we call post-operative scotoma. Okay? So pinch areas that you start off your iron skin from can sometimes um, result in areas of nerve fiber layer defect. Okay? So you know, increasingly people are wondering whether or not they're causing more harm or good by doing peers in that manner. Okay. So what are modified ILM kinases? Okay. So what we want to achieve in these cases is actually to, to preserve the epifovial ILM. So we don't want to touch it, we're going to leave it alone. Okay. And for us to do that, um, there are different uh, different ways of doing it. So okay. you can do it um, for, by what we call a macular rexis. Okay. So it's very similar to how you would do your, your capsular rexis in your cataract surgery. Okay. Or what you can do also is if you can do multiple small uh, curvy linear keels around the, uh, the, the, the foveal region such that they overlap, what you would do ultimately is that you would um, end up with, a, with an area um, over the fovea that's untouched. Okay? And that's what you want to leave um, alone. Okay? So how do we do a um, macular rexis otherwise? Okay? I prefer this method over the, um, the other method okay? because I find it's much more controlled and it's much easier for you to do. Okay. So what you do in this case, right, is you would need to raise a flap as you normally would do, right? So after raising a flap, you would do a rexis over the macula like you would do for your, 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 your capsule, your, your capex surgery. Now, what you do is after that, feel the membranes inwards such that you leave the foveal area still attached, right? And instead of yanking that off like we normally would do, we would put in a uh, retractor, a cutter, into the area and cut off the loose flap around it so that we are left with a small little circle of intact ILM over the foveal. Okay, and we just leave it like that. So the Taiwanese group was the, the group that um, pioneered this um, technique and they have reported that yes, it does work, even though there's a little bit of um, ILM left at the foveal region, um, the disguises does resolve right, over time, uh, over 2 to 21 months. And uh, the, 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 the vision also improved as well as we'd expect with um, improvement of spices. Now, um, then now we come to uh, an, an increased level of severity, which is myofibular spices with the macular hole. Okay? So the problem with this is that um, the prognosis in these eyes are usually very poor. Okay? Macular hole closure and visual improvement after. Uh, retracting and even if you did the heel and even if you did the gas um, exchange, which is, is usually reported to be less than 40%. So you know, that's usually classified as quite risky. Right? Now, and on top of that, um, these patients are also very liable for um, retinal detachment as well. Now, what are the prognostic indicators okay, that um, tell you that you know, this eye is not going to do well? Yeah? So, firstly, if they already have a retinal attachment, then you know that this is an eye that you know, probably is not going to do well, no matter what you do. If the patient's got very high axial length, especially more than 30 millimeters in length, then again, you know, this may not be something that uh, over promise the overpromise the patient, right? If the patient's got very poor preoperative visual acuity, counting figures or worse, then these are also eyes that you know probably don't want to overpromise as well. Now, what is the rationale of um, ILM healing uh, in, in these eyes? Okay, so basically, what um, is believed? with ILM healing is that you actually completely remove the uh, pre-macular tractional uh, elements, so all the epiretinal membrane, interglossal limiting membrane, anything that causes traction on the surface of the retina, okay? And in so doing, you actually improve the elasticity of the retina. Hopefully, um, with the improved in elasticity, the um, retina can start to conform with the, the contour of the posterior staph lobe, right? The removal of ILM um, scaffolds um, is also another theory as well, that you know, th this um, ILM actually is a scaffold. It's, it's a platform for a lot of cell migration and proliferation of glial cells. And um, in leaving them there, okay, the traction can only get worse. Yeah, so that is the retinal behind the heel. Now, there is yet another uh, way of um, uh, uh, dealing with the macular hole in these um, circumstances. Now, this is something that everybody is talking about now. Again, this is un not completely proven, right? And some people do not believe in it. It's what we call the inverted ILM flap technique, right? Where um, instead of peeling the, the whole um, membrane off, what we do is we peel it such that we leave it hanging by the edge of the macular hole, and then we sort of stuff the uh, free hanging flap 
into the hole itself, right? And what is the rationale? Right? The, the, the belief okay, is that it actually compensates for retinal shortening. So in these cases, uh, when the staphylomy is actually getting bigger and then your retina is not elastic enough to, to stretch, right? So there's actually a deficiency in your, your retinal length, retinal length. So by putting the flap into the area, you're actually filling the hole and uh, in a way increasing the length of your, of your retina, okay? And the other uh, possibility is that also it may act as a scaffold. So if you want something for um, your cells and your, um, your, your gliosis to take place over so that you can fill up the hole. So in putting the ILM in that area, hopefully all the cells can actually use that um, uh, scaffold to crawl over the surface that you want to fill, okay? Um, and last, um, some people also believe that you know, in putting a barrier in that area, so your ILM forms a barrier, um, uh, um, so that fluid doesn't penetrate from the vitreous and, and, and uh, uh, go into the hole, um, and therefore it actually preserves the function of your RP uh, to prevent um, more damage on the body. Okay, so in having done this technique, okay, the anatomical success okay, of doing this inver inverted flap technique has gone up from you know seventy percent or forty percent in some cases to almost hundred percent apparently. Okay, now. The last um, uh, area that I want to touch on is really macular buckling. Um, again, this is also very new and it's very controversial. Right? Some people believe in it, some don't. Um, the, 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 um, there, there are different ways of creating an indent at the macular region. Right? So earlier in the day, I think we had uh, something on scleral buckling. So the, the um, intention of doing a buckle, for example, is really to create an indent in the area to remove traction. So this acts the same way by creating an indent at the back of the posterior hole um, to remove traction. Okay? You can do that by putting a, a prong, right? basically a buckle in that area, um, a specialized one or a prong that you don't use for your, your regular scleral buckling. Um, or you can also use, um, uh, more recently, uh, what we call long-acting hyaluronic acid. Okay, so your OVD that you use your, for your uh, cataract surgery can be made into uh, longer acting versions that can be actually injected via the supracoroidal space into the macular region to create the indent. Okay? So what you're seeing here is really what we call the endoprong, right? With the indenting head. So it's got this big bulbous head that causes an indent of the macula. Okay. So um, what is the um, uh, the, the efficacy of doing a macular buckle, all right? So it's been quoted that um, the, the rate of fulvous gases resolution, okay, and fulvous reattachment is very high, okay, and very quick. So the mean uh, resolution can be, you know, uh, in the range of 1.8 months, so less than two months, which is not what we normally see with the retractomy, right? And most of the eyes actually will uh, go on to full attachment in three to four months. Yeah? Um, it is also uh, thought that the um, functional uh, improvement is also better than if you were to do a retractomy. Okay? So the uh, functional improvement uh, has been uh, cited to be from 30% to as high as 90% yeah, with an implant to make a uh, attachment. Okay? Now, it also has been um, uh, stated that when you have a macular buckle in that area, okay, the, um, even if you had a persistent macular hole, sometimes macular holes will close, right? In fact, it is very um, more likely to expect that macular doesn't close at least um, uh, at eyes than for the population to have any. So even if you had a persistent macular hole, right, the progression from a macular hole to a retinal detachment, right, after a macular buckle is much lower than if you have done the retractable. Um, so this is what we were talking about, high anatomical success rate okay, for retinal reattachment as well as macular closure. Right? So in a range of about 90% in different studies, as opposed to retractomy, uh, which can range from you know, 50, 40% to as high as sometimes 70%, which is the highest that's usually quoted. Okay? Now, what is the um, mechanism of a, um, a, a macular buckle? What are we actually trying to achieve with this um, area, right? So what it does is we believe that it actually mechanically counteracts the anterior posterior traction along along the uh, posterior staphyloma. All right. So what you want to do is actually what we call create retinal redundancy. So you want more retina so that retina that's existing can actually relax and stop stretching so much. Okay. And it's also believed that perhaps it also helps with the stretching of the um, relieving, relieving the 
the stretch on the retinal arteries so that the metal hole can also close more easily as well. Yeah. Um, so the, the problem in these um, eyes really when you do an active buckle um, are that it is not an easy technique to do. Right? If you're going to be putting in a regular buckle or even an annual buckle, um, you have to gain access to the posterior fold, which is not really easy to do. All right? So um, sometimes you do end up um, risking surrounding tissue, like muscle, uh, vortex veins. If you've got vortex veins are badly um, affected, then what you can do is sometimes end up with a very bad quality attachment. Okay? Scleromalacia is also another uh, issue as well. Now, um, one of the um, problems that uh, we now know can um, happen um, is that can the, the indent or the excessive compression of the choroidal vessels in the posterior fold can actually cause choroidal ischemia. Right? And because of this choroidal ischemia, what happens is you get a lot of RD changes, a lot of serious detachment and choroidal effusion. So you can see in this area, you can see huge bulge in this area from a very, very um, high buckle that's placed at the macula. Right? And these patients over here um, often get very bad atrophy and they end up with comfy fingers or worse vision anyway. All right. So, in summary, um, when we talk about macular fold dysplasis, we know already that the uh, pathogenesis is, is still very unclear. Okay, we talked about mechanical displacement in the posterior staphyloma. We talked about the rigidity of the inter internal limiting membrane, and of course, BMT as well, and stiff retinal vessels. All right. We also talked about how natural history is very variable, but that actually a large proportion of them can stay very stable for a very long time or even if they were to deteriorate, they deteriorate quite slowly. Okay, so don't be in a hurry to intervene. Yeah? So observation is recommended for stable cases. If you intend to um, consider surgery, then what are the indications? Okay? So one would be symptomatic eyes, okay, visual loss, uh, metamorphosia, if you have poor prognostic uh, indicators, pre-macular traction, if you have foveal detachment already, macular hole for sure, okay, uh, uh, and a uh, disguises that's involving the entire macular um, uh, area, uh, OSIS junction uh, disruption, and a very thick central retinal thickness, okay, uh, more than 300 microns. And uh, we talked about surgical options, being retractomy at this point, with gas or without gas, um, and with different evolving methods of ion healing, and also possibly macular buckling becoming more on trend in the future, okay? So um, I'm going to leave the last 10 minutes for uh, questions if you have. Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Well, my question is not for you, but for all the audience who have experience with the dorsalamide in cases of myopic phobia skysis. How it is is the results in the long term since you just started using it. So, can you have elaborate on this? Okay, so he's asking the rest of the floor as to whether or not you have any um, experience using dozolamide for the resolution of skysis, right, you're talking about. Anyone since that? Or anyone, you know, has any opinions as to whether or not it's going to work? Yes. Dozolamide we have used uh, in certain patients who had uh, skysis secondary to the X, the, in the X-linked retinal crisis might have a role. Can you speak into the mic? So yeah. Uh, Dorsalamide has a role in X-linked retinal crisis, and that too not in all the cases, only in a few percentage of cases. The pathology here is completely different. If you have a posterior staphyloma, if the redundant retina is there, there is a tangential traction happening. So it might not be having, that's what my guess for posterior. Well, what, what is your experience? Well, the problem is with the visual, visual equity at which you start operating. I have a patient who is stuck with 612 vision and then should I go ahead with the surgery, surgical part or uh, we go ahead with the, just the medical management and wait for more deterioration of the vision? Yeah, and so that, 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 um, that is a good question, right? So like I said, a lot of patients can have 6, 7.5, 6, 9 vision and the OCT can be, you know, like very dramatic um, to intervene in these patients. So it's really um, a, a matter of weighing your um, risk-benefit profile. Um, I would say that if you have patients with good vision, okay, like I would normally watch them, and if I'm seeing the patient for the first time, patient 6, 7, 5, 5, 8, 6, 9, not very symptomatic or very mild symptom, then I might say, look, you know, come back in about two or three months then, or what other um, features are, people, uh, are there. 
uh, come back later. Let's see what 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 sort of progression um, you know becomes evident at that time. So you know, for all you know, it may stay like this for a very long time. Right? In which case, then you may not want to intervene. But at six twelve, you know, if you have all um, attachment and the patient's very symptomatic, you have a very very widely separated sciences, You know, I think it's it's um, probably something to consider um, intervening. Six twelve is is actually. Um, a very reasonable vision to intervene. Like what I worry about intervention is six seven point five vision or six six vision. You know, those are the ones that something went wrong. It's very hard to take account to the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. What is your your uh, experience with the dolomite? Just asking. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.
and back before you actually put the tissue over. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in cases uh, of uh, photoshysis and macular hole, uh, do you have any experience with using autologous blood or platelet rich plasma transforming growth factors? No, I've not, I've not used it recently. I've used it about 12 years ago. Um, you know, it's it's not something that um, is easy to do in our setting because, um, you know, you have to take the blood, you have to spin it down, and then you have to make sure that it's, you know, sterilized and you need to make sure that it's injected and things like that. So in the local setting, it's not easy to do. Um, uh, when we did it uh, as part of a, a small clinical trial, uh, 12 years ago, um, it did not show that it actually was much better than doing a chemo. Okay, so I don't know what, whether or not you're asking this because you have had experience doing it or whether you have had positive experience doing it. So, during our fellowship, we had mm -hmm. um, done a trial, it's ongoing, uh, using platelet rich plasma in cases of large macular holes, more than 600 microns base diameters, traumatic holes, secondary holes. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, most cases, uh, there was a good uh, outcome, good anatomic closure was achieved. Mm -hmm. And uh, the vision remained same or we got about one line improvement. So vision-wise, it wasn't uh, that much great, but we achieved uh, cool. anatomic closure of the holes in most of the cases. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the Did you also do it in um, uh, idiopathic holes as well? As uh, well? The yeah. large ones, yeah. We didn't take the smaller holes. Yeah, okay. So. Um, you know, there, there are also um, components of um, the, the technique where you actually traumatize the edge of the hole a little bit, okay? And that creates inflammation, and that, that sometimes you get a little bit of cells uh, released in that area, and possibly that causes some fibrosis, the glial, the proliferation of the area. So I think it, it probably is uh, not similar, but related to what you're doing now, injecting um, growth factors and probably cells from your uh, serum or even your platelets and all that. So um, yes, I, I, I do think that, um, especially in traumatic holes, okay, um, when you have very large traumatic holes, um, in the past I used to sort of um, graze or, or use my MDR blade huh, to actually scratch the, the, the margin of the hole a little bit. And I find it actually flows better than you know, to just do a PRD in the hole. So yes, so you, you are right. Um, it's a similar concept that you're trying to, to instill um, some inflammation and some cells and growth factors in that area. Yeah. Any question there? Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, is it a break now? Yes. Okay. Alrighty, so I'll see you later. Okay.